Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Molly Carmichael with Zonda's Inspirational Leadership Series, joined by the industry's best in all things real estate. These leaders are literally designing our future for many generations to come with new communities, home designs, technology, retail centers, infrastructure, and so much more. This series is about who they are, how they got started, who inspired them, and their journey to the top. So let's get started. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. This is Molly Carmichael with Zonda. And today we have one of the smartest leaders and advisors in the investment world. Please welcome Margaret Whelan. A little bit about Margaret. She's the Chief Executive Officer and Founder with Whelan Advisory Capital Markets. The company is actually focused on advising clients with M&A and raising capital. And I think you're going to hear Margaret has a great story. She's born and raised in Ireland, courageously moves to the United States right out of college to start a new future. And frankly, she worked with some of the best in the industry and listened well and strategically made her way to the top. She worked with great firms like UPS, JP Morgan. And today, Margaret's now notably one of the best in our industry today. She's smart as ever. She's incredibly articulate. And as you will hear in her story, she's an entrepreneur, super innovative in her approach to all things in business and in life. I'm constantly talking to her about how she manages it all. Thank you for joining us. We are here today with one of my favorite people. People, It's Margaret Whelan with Whelan Advisory. She's the founder and chief executive officer for her company. Margaret, welcome. Thank you, Molly. It's great to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. So, so tell us a little bit about you as we dive into kind of your history there. You have so much color, I think, to uh, coming over from another country, uh, you know, all of your background in what you do today, but also just all the history that goes with um, being one of the top leaders in the country. So tell us a little bit about what you do, what your role is, and what an average day looks like for you. Sure. Um, so uh, I guess for the benefit of the audience, I'm actually from Dublin, Ireland. So I'm an immigrant to the U.S. I moved here after graduating from University College of Dublin in 1994 uh, to New York City from Dublin and went straight into investment banking and straight into working with housing and construction companies, which I absolutely love. I love the concept of home ownership, rentership, just um, shelter. I think being an immigrant, it's maybe more important to me because it's so less attainable. And uh, so investment banking is a skill set. Understanding housing is a skill set. Obviously, you and your team help many of us in the industry with that. And we specialize in representing owners and founders of housing and construction companies. They usually come to us at a pivot point in their uh, company growth where they need more capital whether they're ready to sell the company outright or to sell a majority position of the entity, or they just need some growth equity because they're expanding beyond passing a hat at the golf club or locally with friends and family. Um, in terms of an average day, is there is there any such thing? I guess I'm a person who really values sleep. So my best days start at around eight o'clock the night before when I'm in my PJs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, getting ready to go to bed, candidly, I, I need a good seven or eight hours of sleep. I like to wake up before six and work out. Uh, I have four young children in elementary school, so I like to spend time with them when I'm not traveling, and I do travel a lot. And then I'd say I'm on my desk by 8 a.m. at the latest Eastern time most days and spend an awful lot of time on Zoom. I feel like uh, the pandemic really acceler accelerated a lot of positive change for a lot of us who are in the client service business because we can do so much now via video versus traveling. Um, and we spend a lot of time preparing our clients to go to market, to get ready and to go meet the the partner or the investor they're looking for. It, it's so true. It's, it's amazing how much you can get done. And quite frankly, I love being in person, but it, it really has, I think, changed how we do business. Um, so fascinating background. I'm going to take you back a little bit further. We're going to go back to, I love the fact that you're from Ireland, of course, by own Irish roots and all of that stuff. So I know there's a fantasy about all of that, all of us who actually are Irish and, and all the things that go with that. But tell me a little bit about growing up in Ireland and sort of the history there. I think we're also 
loyal to uh, what we believe those roots to be about and all the things that go with that. But uh, tell us a little bit about that. It def it's definitely fascinating to come to America from Ireland because <laughs> Ireland is such a small country, less than 5 million residents, 300 people in a million people in America, and most of them seem to be <laughs> sort of Irish descent, right? Especially yeah. around St. Patrick's Day. Um, <laughs> I would say that um, my goal when I was growing up was to leave Ireland, and it was really a function of the timing. So I was born in 72. I graduated from university in 94 which was a couple of years before the peace process. Um, so growing up in Ireland in the 70s and the 80s, we had extensive political uncertainty. Um, it, was, it was really a sad time. You know, the economy was a mess. Tourism is, was not what it is now. And um, the unemployment rate when I left was around 30%. So all of my classmates and I graduated from university and wanted to get out of Dodge. Literally, we were all leaving to go to London, to go to America, to go to Asia. And I I was graduating with an undergraduate um, in finance. So it was quite common for the big banks on Wall Street to come to Europe to the top business schools and recruit us. And, and that was how I came here. Now, when you talk about housing being attainable here and all of that, um, obviously with 30% unemployment in Ireland and things like that, was it a lot less attainable in Ireland? Is that the reference or...? It, it was just the, uh, I think when you have so much political strife and economic uncertainty, there's very little hope. And uh, for me, I just, I wanted to be financially independent. I, and I still do. I would say that is the most important thing that drives me every day. Because I, when you when you grow up in, a, in an environment where there's so much uncertainty, um, people are just less happy. <laughs> you know, it's... People, sure. all, all people from all nations are stereotyped for a reason. And so there's a lot of alcoholism in Ireland and there's a lot of uh, cloudy days. And you put that together with 30 percent unemployment rate. I think Ireland was just a, diff a different time when I was growing up. Sure. I left in 94. I came to America. Um, fast forward a couple of years, the peace process was negotiated. The fighting stopped. The economy took off and they had the Celtic Tiger. Um, after Y2K. And actually, a lot of my college friends went back to Ireland or to Europe and started their families there. For me, I just absolutely loved New York, loved Wall Street, loved housing and what I was doing. And even though when I was working for UBS, which was the uh, Union Bank of Switzerland based in London and Zurich, I was the global head of our housing team. So I would get to travel all over the world all the time, which I loved. But I always wanted, I considered New York my home. I always wanted to come back here. That is so cool. So, so going back to, and, and you know, what everything that you talked about, it's interesting. I went back to Ireland uh, just before the pandemic and it was just, I mean, you hear about the history, obviously I've got lots of family there, blah, blah, blah. That the strangest part for me was, I think really just seeing the change and all the things that changed around that. And I, I won't go down that rabbit hole. Let's stay with you. But let's it improved dramatically. It, I mean, even for me, because I have my children, we're go, we go home, we go to Dublin twice a year. We're actually going again in March. Um, and uh, it has changed and improved dramatically in the last 30 years, which is fantastic. Yeah, it, and it's, it's just, there's nothing like it. It's so beautiful. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about when you were... Um, Going back to kind of your formative years, what would you say, or did you have a coach or was there a sport or was there a thing that really taught you to be as driven as you are today? Or or did that just naturally happen? Do you think you were born with that? Or I mean, I always kind of, just about mm -hmm. every person I've talked to in this category, it's like, and it was that moment that I knew, you know, mm -hmm. fill in the blank. Right. Yes. Um, well, being financially independent was important to me. So education was a priority for my family. Um, my parents, I, I have three sisters and the four of us went to the school, same convent school that my mother and her sisters went to had the same the same nuns teaching us and beating us as uh, my mother and her generation had. And um, right there with you, I get that. <laughs> right. So that, that was another reason to leave as opposed to a positive influence. But I would say I absolutely love the water and I grew up sailing because Ireland is a very small little island. You can get from Dublin, where I grew up, to the West Coast, Galway, where there's fantastic uh, waves and, and sailing. 
um, sailing clubs. And we would go cross country with our boats on the back of our uh, cars all the time. <laughs> I grew up sailing and racing sailboats. And I actually still do. I run the women's sailing group at my club in East Hampton, New York in the summers. And I think, oh, uh, what, yeah, what, what I underestimated about sailing, I guess I just didn't have the perspective because I only had sisters, no brothers. We went to a convent school, all girls. And then I went to university, graduated at the top of my class and came to the States. Um, sailing is a gender neutral sport. Oh, and sure. so you have to be, and you sail too, right? So you just, yeah. you have to be very well prepared, very organized, literally expect the unexpected um but when you do that you go out on the water with a very clear mind and ready to compete or ready to train whatever the plan is for the day and you can roll with everything and anything that comes up and something inevitably does and I think that was probably the best um training the discipline that I learned in, ten, in terms of being organized being reliable being punctual being useful because I was crewing when I was younger now I, I I'm at the helm um, and then also the fact that uh, it really didn't matter what your gender was. You just had to have the skill. And so when I came to America and came into investment banking, there definitely were a lot fewer women in my training program at, at my age or level. Um, and this, and especially a lot fewer women of pe or people of color um, ahead of me as role models. But I, I really Is didn't really notice or Across our whole industry, I would say that's the case. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, well, investment banking, I do want to say, I think is a little better than housing. Um, but because um, housing hasn't changed, there's a ton of affirmative action on Wall Street and bringing um, more diverse candidates in to start their careers and then hopefully to advance. Um, but for me, it, it's only, as you know, in the last five years that anyone has really talked about or thought about diversity and the benefits of that to the bottom line. And um, for me, now people ask me about it a lot, but about what it's like being a woman as a CEO or a founder or an investment banker in construction. I'm like, I, that's irrelevant. I just need to be youthful and to have is, a high character. Is, is that a new question for you? Because I feel like I've had that question my whole career. And half um, the time, like you, I'm like, I don't even think I realize it. I already yes. anyways. And I was very fortunate to have, you know, leaders in my life that it never came up with them. You know what I mean? So yes, um, right it, it, it's always been. I mean, people have always said to me, "God, you know, how did you how do you get to this level so quickly?" Because I was very young. I was a managing director at UBS when I was just turning thirty, and and it was just I had a single mind to focus my career. Um, I didn't have the distractions that a lot, other, a lot of other people had. But yes, I do get the question more often because I think there's a lot more affirmative action. And it often comes from uh, men who are fathers of daughters, girl dads, who sure. say to me, I want my daughter to be as independent as you, you are. And, you know, what, what was it in your childhood? What was the experience that influenced that? And, and that was, I think, more than anything else was the failing. That's so cool. I, I love that analogy. Well, let's talk about how you grew your career. <clears throat> so you come over here, graduated from college. Tell us a little bit about that experience in growing your career. Were there key, were there key people sort of in that process uh, helping to influence that? Are there key movements you made? Tell us how you did grow so quickly. I mean, it is impressive. Well, uh, I love Tony Robbins and he likes to say success leaves flu. So you can see successful people all over, right? There's so many successful people in your side of the business, the consulting and research, in my side of the business, investment banking, in um, well, among our clients, our shared clients, the home builders, so many incredibly impressive executives. And it, for me, I was just always watching the people that were most successful. So everyone knows of Molus Investment Bank now. It's a big publicly traded company. But when I started my career in the early 90s at UBS, I was actually sending faxes for Ken Molus. <laughs> like, <laughs> Molus is actually a guy who I worked with. It's funny because when you look at his success now, it is not a big it's surprising. He was so incredibly impressive. You know, I grew up watching Wall Street and all these movies. And then you meet this guy who's like, I don't want to say he's Gordon Gecko because that would be um, uh, impolite. He's like, he's just so impressive um, and so successful. And you see people like that and they're very straightforward. They're very smart. They go 
to every meeting groomed for success, to their appearance, to be taken seriously. They're very well organized and prepared. I mean, if I was going as a member of his team to a meeting, everything had to be ready. Uh, we had to be better than anybody else. We had to be very useful to our clients. What I do is, is uh, serve on business. You're there for other people and you have to focus on the clients. It's never about you. And um, so <clears throat> he would be a role model for the decade that I spent at UBS. And then I was at J.P. Morgan for about eight years and worked directly with Jamie Dimon because unfortunately I, st I went over there in 2007 just as the global financial crisis was emerging. Uh, J.P. Morgan was the biggest lender to the housing industry. So they had significant balance sheet exposure <laughs> to housing. And so um, that, uh, that allowed me to, to be uh, front and center with Jamie very often, which was again, an incredible learning experience. It's, it's amazing, I think, when you start out your career to have somebody that polished and that good and to be able to literally look at it and say, OK, it's it's almost like starting a routine or um, it it's it's amazing how those people influence your life very early on and help to shape sort of, OK, that's what I need to do. And it, it literally sharpens your skill almost yeah. immediately. So that's but we, we, they're so serious and they're so intense and they're so disciplined. Anyone can roll out of bed and not be groomed, right? right. But the people right. who are stand out, they take themselves seriously and you're going to take them more seriously. And they're more organized and they're more prepared. And because of that, they can be more assertive and have a bigger influence in this in these meetings. And we're competing. I'm competing all the time for business with other folks who do what I do, as, as we all are, right? And so the way you present yourself and the consistency that you have with that, I think is important. Now, when you were, I'm going to go back a little bit to, again, formative years. When you were growing up, did you know you wanted to do this or it, what did you want to be when you were older? I didn't know what this was. <laughs> I'm quite wondering, I'm like, does anybody grow up and say, hey. <laughs> I remember it was very sweet because my parents are not that sophisticated and they thought I was coming to America to be a bank teller. And so the first year <laughs> they came to New York and I had an apartment in Queens with the other Irish people and they they were fascinated. They're like, oh, you don't you wear a uniform or don't you wear a name tag? <laughs> so, um, no, I had no idea. I just wanted, really, I wanted to get out of Ireland and get out of Dodge and have some independence, some financial independence, some hope and opportunity, I guess. That's pretty exciting. So if you were to say what you love the most about your job today, what is that? Uh, representing clients. I love the client interaction, helping them, uh, protecting them, generating success on their behalf. It has to be really, uh, it has to mean a lot to you to see pushing a business forward, helping them to be successful, you know, and doing everything you do. I mean, it really changes their entire organization, their world, right? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's also what we do because we represent so many private home builders on their sale on the M&E side. It's really creating a life-changing liquidity event, crystallizing the value they have invested so much into for so long. And it's often very meaningful wealth creation. And it's also selling an entity that many of them consider to be a baby. You know, oh, usually sure. their name oh. is on the door, their family, their friends work, their customers are important to them. And so it's incredibly emotional. And all that goes along with that is very important. We had a transaction close earlier this year um, uh, where we represented a seller. And he told me, you know, that deal died several times. And the only reason we got to the finish line, which he wanted to, was because of my steadfast, uh, not overreacting, not being emotional, not being dramatic, just kind of being focused on this is where we are, this is where we need to be. And these, these are the steps. Well, I think these businesses, and you can relate to this with your own business. I mean, think about the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into building that business, the sacrifices you make, the, mm -hmm. the nervousness <clears throat> and the risk that you take in starting off, yeah. right? I mean, that's, that's incredible. Let's talk about that. So, so you go to start Wheeling Advisory. What was that like? And, and what was the reason for the leap? I um, mm -hmm. have to imagine that was a, a huge risk on your part. And that certainly paid off. Tell us a little bit about that and what drove that. You know, you look 
back end, and it it looks like it could have been a risk. And um, the thing about it is that I started the business in the fall of 2014, at which I had graduated in the fall of 1994. So I had been an investment banker on Wall Street for 20 years, which is really joggier. <laughs> so it's like 140. And um, and I was in my late 30s. No, actually, I, I was older. I was 42. I had uh, four children. In 2014, my oldest was three. I had a two-year-old and I had two newborns. You remember this. I do, and, I do. Right? And and I just was really not happy. I, I don't think I had postpartum depression. I just think that my relationship with my husband is incredibly important to me. I didn't feel like I was bringing what I needed to as a partner. I felt like I wasn't doing well as a mom, which was pretty hard, by the way. And, um, and then also just professionally. So I just said, I'm, I'm just going to take a break and I'm going to stop. And so um, within minutes of resigning from a big job, which was the, the main source of income for my family. So that was a risk, I guess. But within minutes of doing that, thinking, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be a mom for a couple of years, I realized I, how much I needed the stimulation and how much I missed that. But there's no half measures in investment banking, especially when you're an MD and a group head or global head. You've got a lot of people, a lot of balls in the air, plates spinning. So I wanted to do it on my own terms. And I had seen with so many great private home building and housing construction companies, the opportunity was there. There was a hole in the market to offer an incredibly high level of service to a small group of companies. So that is what I set out to do 10 years ago. Um, I grabbed Andrea Finger, who we had worked together for 19, 20 years before that. We were long-term colleagues and a few other folks who had worked with me and put the team together. And we grew it very slowly, very deliberately. And I'm incredibly proud that in the last five years, we've closed over 30 transactions with about $14 billion in value. Uh, we are certified as a we bank, woman-owned firm, and uh, our, con our success continues. It continues to grow, but only because our clients are so great. You know what? So I have two questions following that because there was so much there. But but the very first one is, what do you think it is about what you do that people continue to seek you out and your company continues to thrive so well? Well, we're known as the closer. The deals we bring to the market close. They tend to close faster than others. And we, we apparently have a much higher ratio of deals to close. And I think that's because we're very thoughtful and careful about the mandates we take on. And then the timing, we're not rushing anybody or anything to go to market. And we're very disciplined and that approach has worked well. When we bring an opportunity, the buyer tend to respond very quickly because they know we're serious and it's going to be competitive. And so that apparently is different to some of my peers and has contributed to the the closer reputation. I'm going to add one more thing. I think just knowing you over the years is I think you also have very deep relationships and you know everybody. I mean, and and so I think to really align people, you have to be able to, it's almost like a matchmaking experience, right? You yes. really figure out who aligns with who. And if I'm selling my baby, I wanted to go to the right group that I know it's going to match. It's going to continue yes. to thrive all that stuff, right? Or if yeah. I'm just getting more, you know, whether it's equity or debt, whatever that is, I really wanted to go to the right group because I'm this yes. is a long-term relationship. Yeah, so, you know, it, yes, it, it's not just about the lowest cost of capital if you're if you're rate, recruiting us or hiring us to help you raise growth capital or about the highest multiple if you're recruiting us to sell your company. A lot of it is about the chemistry and the fit. So sure. the fact that we know people so well, um, I think that's a big part of it, Molly, for sure. The other thing is we, we have a client right now, a big private builder, top 50 builder that we're representing. And he had a, a broker or an advisor previously that was not a good fit for him. And he said, you know, Margaret, I made a mistake because he had interviewed me, all of us about five years ago and hired someone. And he said, I hired the guy who told me what I wanted to hear, not what I needed to hear. And I had been very specific with him. He didn't have a great CFO at the time. He didn't have audited financials and said, look, I don't think you're serious about selling. And when you're serious, you can call me. <laughs> but Otherwise, there's plenty of people who will get help you get a free appraisal. But I'm actually trying to close deals. Um, so I think just being transparent and being straightforward helps too. 
Well, and I think that's part of the partnership. It's almost like when you go to look for that company you're going to work with, it has to be, there has to be a fit in so many different categories. And the, the I think the constructive areas for growth have to be able to flow both directions. You need to be able to tell them yes. what you need for growth. They have to be willing to hear that, make yes. change, all that kind of stuff. And, and you're brilliant at that. Yeah. The second question I had from what we just talked about was, um, and I can relate to this completely. So I'm going to, I'm going to go girl on you on this one is it, it it is really hard to kind of balance it all. And, and I have had those moments in my own career when I'm like, I'm, I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good wife. I'm not like, I'm just, you know, I feel like I'm not balancing everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've really tried like you, I'm going to, I probably uh, on the air of not sleeping have tried to do it all and, and be it all. And somehow it worked, but how have you managed that part of it? I mean, it's hard to manage it all and be a successful. Mm -hmm. Well, there is no balance. You know, that's the first thing. I think we should all just think about our careers in terms of chapters. And there are times when you can be a rock star and there's times when you can be a superstar and, and either is fine. You know, there, there's a great book I read called Radical Candor, which is about providing feedback. But it's also about recognizing that you can have really, really great executives who just can't fully commit all the time. So whether you have someone taking family leave, maternity leave, paternity leave, going to study, bereavement, right? I mean, we're all human and sure. and, and that means none of us are perfect. So I think being realistic about that, uh, I am very fortunate, I guess, personally, because my husband uh, retired five years ago in 2018. That was a choice that we made. He had a, a full-time mom. A mom was home when he was growing up and I didn't, I was a latchkey kid. And so when our children were younger, he had said to me, you know, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if one of us was home? And I, I was like, why? I think this is quite, <laughs> quite okay. I but trying to me too. I'm the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. The, the logistics of moving four of them around all the time between schools and sports and everything else. And just all the time you want to spend with them. It, it was getting <laughs> harder. So he uh, retired and that allows me to get up and go. Um, and then separately, you know, the balance for me is I just, I don't go out as much. I don't party as much, obviously, like yeah. most two-year-olds, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I I value my sleep. I love my Peloton. Um, I love my dog. I've got a gorgeous golden retriever who wakes me up every morning to get out for a run and uh and then spending time with my children is just such a, a gift and I learned I mean it's, it's fascinating to have a teenager these days right it's fascinating I'm trying to learn as fast as the world is changing I think we all are and they make me feel like an old lady all the time they're just so funny so <laughs> it, it also you know it keeps you humble for sure you know it, I will say it is such a gift Kenny and I did that same thing where it was like okay you know, um, and we did a very similar situation, Margaret, and I'm so thankful to him for that. And I'm sure you are too. I, I just think at the end of the day, it makes you feel like you can concentrate when you need to concentrate. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. All that kind of stuff. I mean, it's huge. Yes. So as you look back at your career, if you were to pick sort of one or two people, like these are my two rock stars in life. These are the ones that, um, you know, if I could be more like, who are your inspirational leaders? No, oh, that's a good question. Well, I guess the I think Jamie Dimon is incredibly smart and astute. I've I've just I even before I worked at J.P. Morgan and since then, if ever there's an opportunity to hear him speak, I'll always take that. Listening to Jamie for an hour is like reading ten books. He's just so sage on the market. He's so straightforward. He doesn't um, waver. He um, He's just such high character. Even he'll admit when he's wrong or has has made the wrong decision, but well, why? He, he focuses a lot on what he's done well versus what he could do better. And I appreciated that an awful lot in my career. Um, there, I mean, there's so many people in the housing industry that are so that have been so successful and and really um, share that expertise. Look at Corey Boydston, for example. You know, our friend, Corey, oh, sure. yeah. and, uh, grandma, but I hear from her frequently. I really miss her on the conference circus, but, circuit. But five, six years ago, as she knew she was winding down her career, she started the Women's Housing Leadership Group, which we desperately needed because yeah. finally we had enough to be a group. And um, and now we <laughs> <do> I... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Before that, there was only the three of us. 
Um, but, <laughs> I, you know, people like that who have just been great, incredible role models, steadfast for me when I needed it as moms, as working moms, as um, as professionals. Uh, I, I would say those are my two people I've worked with directly who have incre- who have helped me uh, in my career. So let me ask you this. If you were to sort of advise young leaders, uh, uh, seasoned leaders, even people are, you know, heading towards retirement, uh, your top three ingredients to be a great leader, what would you say they are? Well, I think you have to really think about what is your brand? You know, what's important to you? Mine is, um, one is, is just the most important one. And top three is high character and high integrity. Um, meaning what you say, saying what you mean, being around the right people. You know, I, I really believe you hang around garbage, you start to stink. And so you just have to be really thoughtful. There's a lot of tough individuals in the home building construction industry, and we just try to avoid those folks. Um, a second thing is just being prepared, being super organized. And um, when when you have the opportunity to meet with a, a senior leader in our in- industry, whatever size company or or uh, revenue that they, profit that company has, you know, be grateful that you have that opportunity and show up on time and be prepared. And I think some of the um, the best lessons are just, especially as we get older, because you mentioned all the way through retirement, that the third tip I would have is sharpening the saw. You know, the seven habits of highly effective people, that's one of them where you have to keep learning and the world is just changing so fast. You have to spend a lot more time on that. At least I, that's something I've noticed the last few years. I think in a post COVID world, it's really accelerated the use of technology that I'm trying to uh, understand and, and leverage. Well, and I think to do all three of those, it's also just being being willing to listen and make those changes quickly, right? And um, yeah, pivot. Yeah, resilient. what are we? Yeah, <laughs> what are we doing well? What are we? What what, mm-hmm. what could we be doing better? And not, not having too much pride in that, right? In in terms sure. of learning and soliciting the feedback, and and also you know recognize the source. Um, someone told me Great recently, point. I was it was a a man who I have no respect for in our industry, but he just said, well, you know, you're so aggressive, and I'm like. Just because I'm so much more successful than you, buddy, doesn't mean I'm super aggressive. If I was a man, it would be you're, you know, you're a baller. But because I'm a woman, so I think you also have to recognize the source and, and ignore a lot of that as well. I don't know if this will make the the cut, but asshole, right? <laughs> Technical term. <laughs> Anyways, Margaret, as always, such a pleasure to talk to you. I feel like you're a sister from another life. <laughs> it is uh, you're smart you're brilliant um, you clearly have a uh, great success in your life personally and professionally and both of those are equally important to me too so thank you yeah. so much for doing this podcast yes yeah, it, it's my pleasure and and likewise we have a lot in common and i appreciate you thank you again for joining us this is molly carmichael and i hope you enjoyed this series Please hit like if you like today's broadcast and subscribe if you'd like to hear more from the best and the brightest in our industry. Take care, everyone, and I hope you join us again next time.